This morning we're going to talk about the power of learning together. And I want to start with my time here as an undergraduate, where I attended the University of Wisconsin right down the street. Like many of you, I am very um, proud of my alma mater. I love it. I have lots of great memories. But I should have known on my very first day when I stepped foot on campus that there might be one building when I walked past would continue to make me kind of want to cringe. Freshman orientation tour. And this is the Memorial Library, where you will spend hours in December locked up in the cages getting ready for exams. I thought, cages? Yeah, way beyond the stacks of books in this venerable institution of knowledge are these infamous study carols. In the study carols, you typically find three things. A lamp, a desk, and an outlet. If you were really unlucky, you might have had one of the carols that had a window in it, so you could be reminded that the world is going on without you outside. I spent more hours than I care to believe in these carols, whether it was studying for psychology or learning Latin conjugations. So why did we hold ourselves up in these carols? We can't actually lock ourselves into these cages. And people, they're still there. People still do that. Why did we do that? Well, for one thing, I wasn't likely to have this with me to capture a five or a 30 minute study session in between my classes. And an average semester, my books weighed over 30 pounds. Not very practical. But more importantly, I was not likely to ask my classmates to study together. In college, we are taught that it's a survival of the fittest. In that very first psychology lecture, I remember Professor Klinker coming in. And this is what he heard. Many of you will remember lectures like this. I promise you, 10% of you will finish this semester with an A. And I guarantee you, 10% of you will fail. Now let's get started. So we were conditioned, we were taught to be competitors, not study partners. And that's unfortunate because it's proven time and again that one of the best ways to learn is to compare and share your understanding with other people like you. When you're back in those cages, you're locked to yourself. Your notes, your books, your questions, your answers. It was really me, myself, and I studying in those cages. If only I had realized then that we are smarter than me. There was a gentleman at Berkeley back in the 70s, his name was Yuri Treisman, he's a student and later a researcher there, who recognized this. And he was um, studying what made some students more successful than others on campus. Most people said it's lack of preparation for college or it's lack of motivation. Some people lack of family support. Yet all these students came to campus with the same credentials, the same qualifications, the same merits. And Yuri didn't buy that. What he actually found after in-depth studies of these groups of students was that what was lacking for the students that were less successful was community. It was collaboration. These students were generally in isolation and didn't have a group that they worked together with. They were essentially me versus you. So he tried something. He set up a series of workshops. He used calculus, which tends to, tended to be then and actually still tends to be um, one of the number one weeder campuses in a lot of colleges. And he took these students that were identified as being more at risk or less successful, and he had them attend a separate workshop. And they were brought together to work together, to work through problems and share their understanding of the information. See, when you bring them together to work it out, the results are dramatic. Those students, time and again, outperformed not just their peers that weren't attending the collaborative sessions, but all the peers in their class. This program was so successful that it took root all across the country. 
It still is in existence on a lot of campuses today. In Texas, students who were assigned to and participated in these collaborative study groups receive an average GPA in calculus of 3.5. Their peers who don't, 1.6. In New York, those that participate in these workshops, average GPA of 3.2, whereas 1.8 is the average grade point for those who don't. This program even has roots right here at the University of Wisconsin um, around 15 years ago. It was employed here in the calculus program, and later it was incorporated into a program some of you may be familiar with. It's called the Wisconsin Emerging Scholars. So why don't we see more tricycle like study groups in classes today? The fact is it's still pretty hard to get together and study with each other. There are social barriers, there are logistical barriers, we don't really think about it, but like, Am I going to go up to the person in the front row of the lecture hall and like, am I wearing the right thing? Or are they going to think I'm dumb? What do I say? Or logistically, like, who's going to go find two or three people, the location to meet, and compare everybody's schedules to make sure we're all at the same place at the same time? It isn't very practical, so we don't see a lot of it happening. But these studies do show that we are smarter than me. Today, technology can change that. It is breaking down the barriers that prevent us from working together in education. It is possible to let every student come to one place and create and share the best study material and find the answers that are most effective to help them learn when they're ready to learn it. We can harness the collective brain power of their peers and put it right into the palm of their hand. This device is a ubiquitous device. The first thing that the poorest people in America in the most rural areas in the world will have today, and increasingly, is one of those. And it's smart enough to be connected to the internet. Even my daughter agrees with how helpful it is. And you know that that's probably the last time she'll do that until she finishes her teenage years. Um, but I want to tell you a story about an experience I had when she was sitting at the kitchen table a few months ago. She was studying social studies, learning about evolution. She was struggling with remembering the years and dates and stages of different species of humans. She typed in to the collaborative app Homo habilis, and up came some other cards, and the first one said, YOLO, next to Homo habilis. <laughs> now, if you don't know Twain speak, that means you only live once. Her eyes lit up. She clicked on that, dropped it right into her study set, said, Mom, it was YOLO 2.3 million years ago. <laughs> now that was in her set of study cards, but you know what? She never had to look at that study card again. It made so much sense to her, it went right into long-term memory. Now the archaeology student down the street in college studying Homo habilis, that probably doesn't quite cut it for him. <laughs> probably has to know things like brain size of Homo habilis, or that their arms were longer than the humans of today, all kinds of things. But with over 6,000 explanations of Homo habilis in these crowdsourced libraries, he could learn that and more. In fact, anybody, no matter what level, no matter what age, no matter what interest they have in Homo habilis, could come in because of the power of computing and get an explanation that's likely to make the most sense to them. The same thing was witnessed in a classroom in Los Angeles last fall. A teacher was trying to figure out if there were ways that she could get her students to engage more outside of class to learn the vocabulary, keep up in class. This was a teacher in East LA, the public high school. These students came from all walks of life, very diverse. They weren't likely to have parents that paid for tutoring even paid for special language apps, certainly not um, fancy laptops. So she just encouraged them to download this free app. And what she found was not just that they were keeping up and learning more words a week than they ever had in the past, but they were connecting with each other. And they even brought that collaboration into the classroom. But they could now add audio and video and text to the material they were studying, the things that made sense to them, examples that they could share with each other. 
they were seeing their progress. They were seeing how many learned their wording. They were getting motivated by the software that was telling them how they were learning as well as each other. But this teacher reports that the most amazing thing for her was that before long, without even her realizing it, they were connecting with peers around the world. They were connecting with other students in rural Portugal and students in private boarding schools in Massachusetts. Because when you use these collaborative apps and technology today, there's no walls around them. The state of education today, not just in the United States, but many countries around the world, is undergoing tremendous transformation. You read every day, budgets are being cut, costs are going up, expectations are rising incredibly. For teachers alone, whether you're in the college level or the high school level, getting your arms around all of the apps out there and what they mean and which ones to use is nothing short of overwhelming. But knowledge is no longer locked up in Ivy League universities. It's no longer confined to $500 textbooks. And it's no longer locked in cages. Right? It's open and accessible to everyone. And it's collaborative. So the ability is there to bring students together to help you find like-minded communities and peer groups that are going to be the most helpful for you to learn that stuff that your teacher is teaching. And it's personalized. So technology has the ability to crunch through billions of pieces of information in milliseconds and know more about your interests and your levels to make sure that you're getting the information that's most helpful before you even know that it exists. The digital world that we live in today gives us the opportunity to create a place where people can come together and learn more effectively than they've ever been able to do before. That's not just an improvement in education. I say that's crucial. In fact, it's possible that we will find that the only truly scalable, cost-effective way to improve education for everyone is to help students help each other. We are smarter than me. Thank you very much.